Welcome to this talk. Today we're looking at the ECG, an electrocardiogram. Now we're going to look at a three lead ECG today and this, the aim of this is, is it gives us a rhythm of what the heart's doing. We can look at the rhythm that the heart is in. And in America for some reason they call ECGs EKGs. Now very briefly I'm going to describe why you get an ECG. Well an ECG is actually electrical activity. And normally we detect this on the surface of the body. So it's the electrical activity detected on the surface of the body as a result of myocardial electrical activity. So let's think about a normal cardiac cycle. The first thing you see in a normal cardiac cycle is the P wave. Now a P wave is generated as a result of atrial myocardial depolarization. Now if you think about a normal myocardial cell, at rest that cell will have an electrical negative charge inside and a positive charge outside. There will be an electrochemical potential difference across the cell membrane. And this gives rise to what we call the resting potential. So negative on the inside, positive on the outside. Now when depolarization occurs, that changes and it becomes positive on the inside and negative on the outside as a result of the flow of ions through the cell membrane. So when it's depolarized, it's positive on the inside, negative on the outside. And the process of changing from being negative on the inside to being positive on the inside is called the process of depolarization. And it's this depolarization which actually stimulates the, myocardium, the myocardial cells to contract. But of course, once the cell is depolarized, in order to depolarize again, it must first repolarize. So when the cell changes from being positive on the inside back to being negative on the inside again, then that process is referred to as repolarization. So, atrial contraction is stimulated by depolarization of the atrial myocardium. This can be detected on the surface of the body, and it's seen as a P wave on the surface of the body. So P wave, we could describe as the electrical activity, as detected on the surface of the body, as a result of atrial myocardial depolarization. Now, the next thing that happens in the cardiac cycle, remember, the impulse is generated in the pacemaker or the sinoatrial node, passes through the atria, probably through internodal tracts, and is collected at the atrioventricular node, down the atrioventricular bundle or bundle of Hiss, down the right and left bundle branches into the Purkinje fibres to innervate the ventricular myocardium. So when the ventricular myocardium is stimulated, the cells will depolarise, this depolarization will be detected on the surface of the body as the QRS complex. So the QRS complex is the electrical activity as detected on the surface of the body, which occurs as a result of ventricular myocardial depolarization. Ventricular myocardial depolarization. Then the next thing that's seen on the ECG is the T wave. Now the T wave does not relate to any kinetic activity in the heart. The T wave is generated as a result of ventricular myocardial repolarization. Now, you might ask, why don't you get uh, a T wave or some repolarization effect after atrial contraction? Well, the answer is that you actually do, but you don't see it because it's buried in the QRS complex. There's so much electrical activity in the QRS complex that you don't actually see atrial repolarization on the ECG. And of course atrial muscle mass is much, much less than ventricular muscle mass. So the T wave, repolarization of the ventricular muscle, the ventricular myocardium. Then there's a small rest and then a small, small gap and then the P wave starts again and that's the next cardiac cycle. So we were talking about electrical activity detected on the surface of the body. So we need, what we're looking for is a PQRST uh, in the right order and regular. So that, that's a quick review of the basic physiology. Now I'm pleased to say, to help us with some of the abnormal rhythms today, we've got David Miller with us, who's our um, resuscitation officer, resuscitation training officer. And he's going to show us how we obtain a normal three-lead ECG trace. David, welcome. Good morning. What are we going to do? Well, John, first of all, what we need to do is attach you to the monitor with these ECG electrodes. Okay, John, so here we have the ECG electrode. 
and um, there's an outer protective cover that we've peeled back and in that we have uh, an outer sticky surface which will um, attach to the skin and in a electrode gel with conducting jelly on to con conduct the impulse and on the other side we have a stud which is then attached to the ECG monitor so the electric current goes from the chest through the gel, gel. into the stud and then back along the wire to the equipment. That's right, yes. Okay, John, so now what we're going to do is attach the leads onto the chest by the electrodes. As we said earlier on, we have three leads and these are placed across the chest. The first lead, the red lead normally, is placed on the right-hand side of the chest just below the clavicle. The second lead, which is normally the yellow lead, would be placed on the left-hand side of the chest, just below the clavicle. And the third lead, which is normally the green lead, <coughs> would be placed on the left-hand side of the chest, just underneath the nipple. Once we've attached these, we need to make sure that they're firmly connected, so we're going to have a good connection on the screen and then we can have a look at the monitor and see what rhythm we've got. So as you can see, now we've attached you to the monitor, we actually have a rhythm on the screen that's coming through quite nice and, and clear. If there was a poor connection or a lot of muscle tremor, somebody was called, then what we may see is this interference on the screen. We then need to look at our leads and check they're on correctly or perhaps even need to change the position of the leads to get a better trace. So let's just clarify that uh, what we've looked at. <coughs> we've got a P wave here which is atrial contraction and then normally there's a downward deflection that you can see which is the Q wave. Then the R wave here and that often falls down below the, what's called the isoelectric line as well, which we'll clarify in a minute. So we've got P, Q going down, the R wave, then it's P, Q, R, then the S wave is the deflection back up to the isoelectric line there. Then finally, the T wave. I haven't drawn that particularly well, but there's a T wave there. So it's P there, Q going down, R wave, S wave, and T wave, PQRST. So obviously there's going to be variations in, in individuals' sinus rhythms, David. Um, you know, t talk us through the, the, the range of sinus rhythms that we see commonly when we're monitoring patients. Okay, sinus rhythm um, is defined as a rate between 60 and 100 beats per minute. And obviously we can see rates that are much higher and much lower than that. Um, a, uh, a rate of less than 60 would be classed as a sinus bradycardia. This may have no clinical significance. It may mean that somebody is extremely fit um, or it may be due to sleep. And the only time that there's clinical significance is if it's associated with hypertension. On the other end of the scale we can have a sinus tachycardia which is a rate of over 100. This could be through stress, um, or it could be due to medical conditions such as thyrotoxicosis. So, so normally between 60 and 100 beats a minute, that sort of range would be normal? That would be normal, yes. So really what we're saying is you've got to look at it in context of, of the patient? Yes, we, we need to have a look at the patient as well as the monitor to decide what's going on. So if someone came in with a heart rate of 45 but the blood pressure was fine, that, that wouldn't concern you? That, that wouldn't concern us. It would only be if we had a fall in blood pressure along with the bradycardia that we would take some action. And, and what, what about children, babies? Um, children have a significantly higher heart rate. Um, children up to 160 beats per minute. Um, but that drops, starts to fall with age. As they get older. As they get older, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so we've, we've looked at the, 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 the normal sinus rhythms, rhythms generated from the sinoatrial node. Um, I think we can now look at those on the, on the monitor, can we? Yeah. 
Okay, John. So here we have a sinus rhythm. Okay, the monitor is telling us that the heart rate's around 80. And if we look at the trace on the screen, first of all, we can see P waves are present. Okay, they're all erect, and they all look the same or have the same morphology. Each of the P waves is connected to a QRS, as you can see on the screen, and there's a, a gap of 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. So there's no block between the SA node and the AV node. Following the QRS, we also have a T wave. Okay? So, as we can see there, it's a sinus rhythm of a rate of about 80. So this would be nor why a normal person up, and that's roughly what yeah. we, would expect, we would expect to that's see. That's what we'd expect to see, yeah. I assume when patients are first admitted, sometimes the heart rate's faster due to anxiety and things till they settle down. Yeah. What, what we would tend to see is a, a heart rate often above 100 um, when they're first admitted to due a to anxiety. Yeah. Due to anxiety. Uh, due to anxiety. Yeah. Um, but of course, we have to rule out other possibilities of, of why they've got a, a tachycardia as well. So, can we see a faster heart rate on this machine? So, again. Here we have a sinus tachycardia. As we can see from the monitor, the heart rate's up to now 140 beats per minute. But again, if we look carefully, we can again see P waves married to QRS complexes. And for every P wave, there is a QRS. And all the P waves look the same. And following each QRS, we also have a T wave. Okay, so it's just a faster rate. The, the, the rhythm itself looks exactly the same, but it's just much faster. The pause between each beat is shorter. So if you were uh, connected someone to an ECG who was out running or cycling mm. or doing some vigorous exercise, that's what you would see? We would tend to see a, a sinus tachycardia. On the other end of the scale, what we may see is a sinus bradycardia. And looking at the screen here, again we can look at the heart rate, which is about 40. So that's less than 60 beats per minute. But, looking at the complexes, we still have a P wave present. And each P wave, again, is married to the QRS with a, a normal time gap between them. So we've still got a P, Q, R, S, T in the right order and regular, yeah, so instead of the sinus rhythm. So a young, fit person, you might, you might see We this. may do, or on a night time on a coronary care unit, we may well see this as well. The other time I've seen this, of course, is patients who've been uh, on beta blockers. Yeah. You often wonder why the heart rate is so slow, then you realise that they're on beta. Been on beta for a long time. Yeah. So we've talked about the sinus rhythm, sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia. What we want to look at now is another rhythm that may well be considered a normal rhythm, especially with increasing age. And what we have here is a sinus rhythm with these ectopics. Okay. An ectopic is a beat that originates from somewhere within the ventricle. These are ventricular ectopics and spread across the ventricle causing these electrical impulses on the screen. It certainly looks very different morphology from the normal QRS, doesn't it? They do. They don't have a P wave because it's obviously not coming from the atria to start off with. And the QRS is much wider than a normal QRS. Is that because it's not following the normal physiological is, pathways? That's correct. It's, f it's having to go from cell to cell rather than following the established pathways. And, and this, is, this is, I mean, you would consider this to be normal, would we? we people could wa walk about or walk onto a coronary care with nothing wrong with them and have unifocal ventricular ectopics. Although, saying that, it may well also be following myocardial infarction, an irritable part of the myocardium and throwing off these ventricular ectopics as well. And unifocal means that the, 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 they're only coming from one particular focus, within one particular ectopic focus within the myocardium. That's correct, yeah. So the other thing we could also have are multifocal ventricular ectopics. As we can see, these again have a different morphology, mm. but they're still broad, bizarre QRSs. So, again, these are just coming from different areas within the ventricle. So there could be two, three, four yeah. or five more you could have ectopic focus. Four or five ectopic focus. And the, this especially may be more common following a myocardial infarction where there's been some insult to the myocardial muscle 
and these ectopic focus start to fire off. But clinically, you wouldn't treat this sort of, there's nothing no, to treat? No, there's nothing to treat. It's just something that we would have to observe. But again, uh, but it could be considered to be, to be normal? It could be. Uh, more so the unifocal than the multifocal, although this could well be normal for, for an individual. We're now going to look at the final rhythm that may be considered normal, and that's a premature atrial contraction. It certainly looks irregular here, doesn't it? Yeah. What's happening is this, fo th this contraction here is coming from a rogue focus within the atria. As we can see, the P wave is of a different morphology to the normal P wave, and that's causing it to go down to the AV node and causing the ventricles to contract. So there's an ectopic focus in the atria, yeah. causing premature atrial, atrial contraction, contraction, but then carrying on down the normal conducting pathway that we talked about, the, yeah. the AV node in the bundle of histone. That's right, yes. And, and again, we can consider this as normal, can we? Isn't we it? could do, yeah. This but is quite acceptable and wouldn't merit treatment. Yeah. Well, that concludes the first part of this talk, looking at normal, uh, uh, the normal range of ECG rhythms.